Brian Funder. Please tell us who you are and what you do at FNB. I am Fundo Mabaso. I am the growth head responsible for the Easy Sub segment uh, at FNB Home Finance. The Easy Sub segment typically takes care of customers within the income bracket of zero to 120,000 Rand per annum, or translated for uh, per month to 10,000 Rand. So as, as somebody who is looking to purchase a home loan within the Easy Sub segment, what would be uh, the minimum requirement for me to apply? So Ntabi, look, uh, the fact of the matter is in South Africa today, it's very difficult to get a property for anyone who is not earning anything from about 3,500 Rand. Um, so uh, typically a customer who's looking to buy a property would be, it would be ideal for them to earn at a minimum of 3,500 Rand and above. Uh, what is fortunate is that um, government also assists customers in the uh, in the low end of the market. So customers that earn 3,500 Rand and less, um, they get assisted by government through the RTP um, pro, uh, process or uh, uh, breaking new grounds program. Um, government also assists customers who earn uh, between 3,500 Rand per month, right up to 22,000 Rand through a program called FLISP or the finance-linked individual, prop, uh, individual subsidy program. It's quite a tongue twister. Yeah, definitely is. So with that said, Mfundo, if I then uh, want to apply for FLIS, what would be the processes of me doing that? Where do I start? Do I start with you as the bank or do I have to go to government? So you would start with the bank. Uh, so one of the requirements for FLIS uh, is that you have to be approved for a mortgage um, uh, before you're able to actually qualify for FLISP. Uh, at FNB, we actually assist our customers with the FLISP application process. So the customer has one uh, point of contact, which would be uh, FNB, whether it is through our uh, app or uh, applying at a branch or with one of our sales consultants. The, the processes that would, would handhold hand the customer through the application of both the uh, home loan application as well as the FLISP application. Okay, and what would be the timelines around that? So um, in actual fact, we work very well with the government department uh, to make sure that it is uh, it all happens in, in, in parallel to one another. So as the customer gets their approval, which is one of the prerequisites or, or requirements for uh, getting FLISP, you have to have an approval for your, for your bond. Once you've got your approval, the application uh, for FLISP then goes through to uh, the National um, Housing Finance Corporation or NHFC, who, who then uh, process your application for FLISP. Once that um, has been approved, which takes about two to three working days, uh, we, we then get a, a confirmation on our side and we proceed with the rest of the application from, an, uh, from a home finance or home loan perspective. So yeah. as, a, as someone, someone that's starting, how, uh, how do I determine what amount of money I actually qualify for from a bank, uh, from a bank's perspective? Yeah. And where so, do I go for that? Okay. So on our FNB app, we have what we call NAV Home. On NAV Home, customers can go onto the NAV Home platform and actually get a, a feel for how much they could actually qualify for and whether they are actually good for the credit. We call it a pre-approval. But if you're an FNB home, uh, FNB customer, what you would generally do is that you will see uh, that we would have pushed on to you a pre-approval, which we call a pre-selected offer. So you would already know what you're good for, which gives you a good indication of what you should be going out to uh, the market and looking for. So Ntabi, for instance, it's always good to know that you qualify for 300,000. Then the properties that you start looking for then fall within your approval or approved amount so that you don't get disappointed later on. 
But the lovely thing about the FLIS program is that even if you do qualify for 300,000 Rand and the government assistance actually gives you uh, a, a further 50,000 Rand, you can use that further 50,000 Rand to actually buy a property that is worth uh, uh, 350,000 Rand. So collectively, the home loan as well as the FLIS assistance from government can then help you uh, buy a, a property that is a, a little bit bigger. So um, your your customer base is, is um, has has different people and different clients that reside in in different areas. So as somebody that is looking to purchase a house in a rural area or in a township where there aren't necessarily any title deeds that are available, are there any helpful solutions that the bank uh, provides for these kind of customers? Absolutely, Tab. So um, looking at uh, business, uh, business, business as usual, uh, customers who are buying in, in areas such as uh, um, rural or tribal authority land uh, where there isn't necessarily a title deed, they can use a, a pension backed um, uh, proper, uh, product, which we offer at, at FNB and they can actually buy or build the property there. Um, but what we've also done is that we've We've, we've seen and identified that there's a big need for assistance or customers that need help uh, in the low end of the market or in South Africa in general because of title deed issues. So we've partnered with various um, uh, uh, outfits that actually assist in this, in this regard. Uh, down in Cape Town, we've got the Transactional Support Center that actually helps customers actually get title deeds for properties that were traded informally. Uh, we also partnered with the Free Market Foundation and their Kayalam uh, initiative, which actually helps customers uh, go through a, uh, getting a title deed for a property that, might, that they might own, but not necessarily have a uh, title for it. So we at f &B believe that partnerships that actually help our customers are absolutely important. And that's why we do the work that we do with uh, these various um, sort of organizations. That's fantastic and that's greatly appreciated. Um, in your point, you mentioned uh, pension back uh, solutions that you guys have. Would you explain what those are? So when, when you buy a property, right, and you use a home loan, uh, we use, uh, the bank will use the property as security and then give you money against that particular property, right? Uh, when you buy a property and you use a pension, we don't use the, uh, the property that you're buying as the security, but we use the pension that you have as security. So we don't withdraw any money from the, uh, from the pension, we just uh, would then hold it as a security uh, for the loan that we're giving. So that helps us make sure that the, uh, the rate um, that is associated with that loan is much lower, and we then give you a loan against the security, uh, against that particular security. Uh, but with the pension uh, backed uh, uh, product, you have to buy a property or be renovating an existing property or building a, a property. Okay. So if you can just give us a practical example of how this pension backed uh, loan works. I think just to make it a bit more clear for us, would appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that is important is that the customer who is looking for a pension-backed uh, loan from uh, from FNB must belong to a pension fund that actually allows for pension-backed lending. The pension that particular pension fund must actually have a an agreement uh, signed with FNB for us to be able to offer this solution to the customer. Now the customer, what, what we then do is that we assess the customer, go and verify how much uh, money is available in their, or it has been uh, accumulated in their pension. And on that basis, we then uh, base what we, how much of a loan can be given to that particular customer. Let me make an example. Uh, Ntabi, you look like a, a, a relatively well-paid person. So let's say that you've accumulated 500,000 in your pension. So if, if your pension is 500,000, that would be the basis on which we assess your, 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 how much of a loan we can actually give you. Now the law allows us to, um, to, to actually lend up to 90% of 
um, uh, of what's available on your pension. So that would that would be the maximum uh, that we can actually uh, borrow you against your pension. Um, and then that that then uh, we then have to go and make sure that you can actually afford that particular loan, which is the maximum. Um, and once we've established that, we can then give you the, the, the maximum all confined um, to how much is available um, uh, in your pension. Would you just shed a bit of light as to what the benefits of one making a deposit towards their home loan are? Yeah. Uh, look, Ntabe, I think it's very important for us to, to have this discussion. So let, let's first and foremost just make everyone understand um, uh, FNB offers customers, especially in the low end of the market, uh, up to 100, 108% of the loan that they need to buy a property because we understand that they, they need that assistance because um, it's, it's more difficult to save for a deposit in the low end of the market. That being said is that we do encourage our customers, those who are able to put down a deposit and save for a deposit, to go down that route because it actually makes the loan a more manageable uh, one because uh, their the repayments over the life of the, of the loan are much lower. When you put down a deposit, the uh, interest rate associated with that particular loan is much lower, which is also then a double benefit um, uh, over, the, over the lifetime of the loan as well. But what, what actually helps customers do when they're saving for, uh, for a deposit is that they start getting into the discipline of actually, uh, of actually repaying or paying for something uh, that they're going towards. So by the time they actually take the loan, they've actually acquired a discipline of repaying and it's something that is not a, a, a shock to their system when they finally um, take, uh, uh, take the loan once they buy their property, just to name a few of the benefits of, of putting down a deposit. So now that I've, I've started my journey and I know how much I qualify for, I know how much I earn, um, in the uh, current economic state, right, uh, would you advise me as somebody that is looking to purchase a home loan to actually go ahead and do so with what is happening right now? Yeah. So, Ntabi, that's a very important question. And it's, it's important for our customers to actually look at their individual situations and circumstances when making that decision. So when you're, when you're buying a property, it's a big investment. It actually is, could be the biggest investment you make of your life. So you have to make sure that one, you're, you actually can afford it uh, and that the, the property that you're buying is a good property as well. So whether it is in, 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 in tough times or in good times, these two things must actually be something that you, you consider. Now, let's go to the economic uh, uh, situation that we are currently faced with. Customers, we, we've seen a lot of activity actually coming out um, from our customers because of the low interest rates. So it has made, the low interest rates have, has made it very easy for our customers to actually qualify for home loans. Um, and we've seen that the property market has actually stayed stable. So uh, the market indicators are actually showing us that there is um, uh, a lot of activity and nothing uh, has changed substantially. But it is important for customers to look at their own individual situations when making this decision. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, um, Fundo. And we look forward to having further discussions with you in future and we wish you well. Thank you very much, Ntabi. Thank you for having me on your couch, uh, although virtual. On the couch, we have our esteemed guest, Bui Maseko. Welcome to the couch, Bui. Please introduce yourself to our guests. Thank you so much, Ntabi. Hi, everyone. My name is Bui Sile Masego. I am the growth head within Home Finance, looking after the affordable housing portfolio, taking care of customers specifically that earn between 120,000 to 350,000 per annum. Thanks, Bui. So on the couch, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions which we believe will benefit our guests. And we would like to encourage you to relax and just have a comfortable discussion with us. Um, so 
uh, what options are available for one if they get declined by the bank as a first-time homeowner or first-time so home buyer, yeah. that is? <laughs> cool. So there's a number of reasons why a customer could potentially get declined for a home loan, right? And I know it's a very daunting um, sort of feeling being a first-time home buyer and being declined. So some of those reasons include having an impaired credit record or credit score. So in a case like that, it's very important for the customer to understand why they've been declined. And then in, a, in that case, they maybe get in touch with the credit bureau and they get a detailed breakdown of all their accounts. So it could be in some cases that the information at the credit bureau is outdated. So that needs to be uh, rectified. Or it could be a case where maybe one of your accounts is not paid, which also needs to be rectified so that you're in a better credit standing. And in some cases, it's more of an affordability issue. So you can't afford the house that you want to buy on your own. Therefore, we encourage you to get a co-applicant or multiple co-applicants in some cases. This will make it more affordable for you to own that house. Okay, so with that said, when the bank communicates with me as a client um, that I've been declined, do they state the reasons why I've been declined? If not, um, what, what guidance does the bank give me in order to ensure that I'm well educated on this and I'm able to rectify um, whatever error has happened? Yeah. Look, so the bank will end. definitely, yeah. So the bank will definitely give you uh, details around why you've been declined. So if it is an issue with your credit profile, they will be, let you know that this is the reason why you've been declined. And then there are different options that then become available to you. If it's an issue around affordability rights or the fact that you have not, an, you don't have enough of a disposable income, there are options that we offer as F and B to help you get into a better financial position. So on the NAV. Um, home on nav home um, in the nav f brother you'll be able to see um, different options around how you can improve your credit record how you can save money on a regular basis so there'll always be options that that the bank will make available to you to to help you own um, that property oh that that sounds like a great value proposition um i want i for one would be one that um takes it up so earlier on, when we were talking about uh, being declined and the various options mm -hmm. that are available, if I'm not able to maybe solve my, my financial crisis, um, is the bank open to, to me applying with a partner or a friend or a family member in order to be a, a homeowner? And if so, what are the processes and what are the advantages around that? Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Look, we encourage customers to look at collective buying, which you can either look at doing it with a spouse, a friend or a family member, because this allows you to afford that property that you want. And also it improves your affordability. So that payment, that monthly repayment or the home loan installments will be split among the individuals who will own the house, right? And the great thing about it is that all the individuals own the house and all of you will be on the title deed. So it's a great way for um, young individuals who are starting off uh, in, in getting into the property market to, to actually start building their property portfolio. And it's also great for parents who want to help their kids own that first property. So, so with that said, um, we all know that when people get excited and they, they discover that they've been approved for a home loan, they are processes that are involved mm -hmm. and uh, timeframes that are involved. Would it be possible for you to indicate um, the timeframes between me applying for a home loan and moving into my house? <laughs> So, so you are right. Look, um, the home ownership process is a bit of a lengthy one. So um, when you apply for your home loan, within three to five uh, um, days, we'll be able to give you an outcome or an indication of whether of the success or whether your application has been successful. And should your application then be, be successful, then we go through the entire home loan process there. It's not a matter of going to look at the property and getting it evaluated. And then also then once that is done and your home loan is granted, it's now going through the process of registering the bond um, at the deed office. This can take um, between one to three months. So in essence, we can say that the, the home loan process from application to you moving in to your home is about a three, three to four month process. 
So with, with the process and the timeframes considered, mm. would you give us guidance on what would be the overall cost of acquiring a home? So look, there's, there's multiple costs associated with, with buying a home. It's probably one of the most one of the biggest investments most people will make in their lifetime. So there's a couple of costs I think that are most important to keep in mind. Um, example, the bond registration and transfer costs, which are probably your most expensive um, during the home buying process. Also looking at um, rates and levies, um, these are your municipal bills for your water and garbage and refuse removal. Also looking at utilities like electricity, um, for this property that you've now purchased and also not forgetting insurance that is very important insuring the property that you bought ensuring the household content in the property so those are just um the few basic ones um above um all that you should always remember that are associated with with buying the house and naturally there'll also be your moving costs and furniture but the ones that i think we we definitely from a banking perspective that we encourage you to save up for from day one is your bond registration and transfer costs for the property. Thank you. So while we're still on costs, um, mm. are the customers that you looking out for or, or um, maybe providing finance for when acquiring a home, do they also have to pay um, uh, tax when they, they acquire their home? You know, there's always that tax bracket mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where people are then, yeah, where customers are then expected to pay a certain amount of money to the taxpayer before they actually get their homes registered and they move into their homes. So look, um, there's, um, during the financial budget earlier this year, there was an announcement regarding transfer duties and how that um, the price bracket for homes has now changed. So if you're buying a property that's below a million rand, you don't have to worry about transfer duties. So those are duty free. I suppose you could, we could put it that way. Um, so specifically for the customer base that I'm looking at, who are looking after rather, who are those customers earning between 120,000 to um, 350,000. If they're buying a property that is less than a million rand they would not have to worry about the transfer duty so that's one less cost that you'll have to worry about fantastic thank you and then just one last question as well uh, when we were talking about acquiring a home with your family member or your partner mm -hmm. or a friend when when i am now ready to to uh, be the sole home owner what are the processes that i need to follow so look in regards to that because the property is registered um in all the parties names so for example me and you have bought this property right so there'll have to be a change done at the deeds office um, to change the, the names that are on the title deed, no longer to reflect both of us, but to reflect you. And then also, you have to come to an agreement with the individuals that you are buying the house with. So it's a matter of, am I buying you out of the property or is it just that simple agreement that look, um, as a parent, you're assisting your child with buying the property. Now they're in a point where they're able to afford it themselves. You will then be removed from the title deed and also then your child can take over the payment of the property and that will then be a process that they process rather that they need to do with the bank as well so it will be a thing of where the bank no longer debits both your accounts but they're now only going to debit one person's account for the property and are they cost associated with that change so not with the not with the um change itself um, so if the bond is not being cancelled, for example, right, it's just a matter of changing um, the individuals on the bond. The bank can assist you with that process um, of doing that. And then there will be a process with the attorneys around registering the property under one individual's name. So the exact cost of that, I'm not entirely sure, but the attorneys will be able to provide you with the cost of actually re-registering. Thank you so much for visiting our home, Bui. Um, our discussion was very insightful and uh, has given one something to think about when they want to be a first-time homeowner. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and good luck to everybody on their home ownership journeys.
everyone. Welcome to The Couch. We have an esteemed guest who will be talking about home loans within the private bank lending space. His name is Carlin. Welcome, Carlin. Hi, I'm Tavi. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. Um, Carlin, please tell um, our clients who you are and what you do at FNB. Sure. So I'm uh, Carlin Madali. I'm a growth head at uh, private bank lending. Um, and, and, and my job pretty much entails uh, delivering uh, client-centric uh, lending solutions uh, to clients that bank in the private banking space uh, who generally earn above 750000 per annum. Oh, fantastic. So this will definitely make our discussion a bit more enriching. Um, so now that you're focusing on people that earn from 750 we're well aware that um, you do have a certain portion of those people that are self-employed. So does the bank offer funding to self-employed individuals and what are the qualifying criteria for that? Um, yes, we most definitely do offer funding to uh, self-employed individuals. Um, in terms of uh, qualifying criteria, we don't have a specific list of requirements um, as we do understand that each individual is unique. Uh, but perhaps let me touch on some of the principles or guidelines that we look at uh, when assessing your home loan application. Um, so the first one would be uh, affordability. So as a responsible lender, uh, we have to ensure that uh, you can afford the monthly repayment every month. Um, and in assessing self-employed uh, individuals, I think the general rule of thumb is um, we'd like to see a good track record uh, of the business for at least two years. Uh, but we will consider, uh, you know, shorter periods uh, in certain, certain circumstances. Um, then we also look at uh, or consider taking cash flow from the business um, to support uh, the individual's affordability, um, in which case uh, we take surety from the business. Um, then some of the other things that, uh, that we look at is, uh, which is very important as well, is um, the applicant and the business uh, banking accounts. Um, as well as the applicant's conduct with uh, other credit providers to ensure that it's been, uh, it's been favorable. Uh, and then lastly, um, which is also uh, very important, is we look at the property and the deposit being put down. Um, so in general, um, the larger the deposit, um, the more likely you are to get a favorable uh, outcome uh, in Tali. Oh, okay, so are you then saying that uh, it's imperative for a self-employed individual to have a deposit towards the home loan before applying for it? Um, so, so, so uh, as a general rule, uh, you know, we do do up to one hundred percent bonds, uh, but it's always uh, more beneficial if you do have a deposit, um, uh, you know, to get uh, the outcome you're looking for. Okay, so, so basically you guys won't turn people away even if they don't have a deposit? No, definitely not. Okay, so in, in, in uh, giving an answer to the first question, you mentioned uh, track record. What, what are those and how do, how do people ensure that they have a good track record? Um, so I think very importantly is to make sure that you uh, pay your normal credit commitments on time. Um, this obviously speaks to uh, you know how well uh, you you pay your accounts and and we use that uh, to understand uh, uh, you know uh, whether you pay in future um, and then uh, you know it's, it's it's also to make sure that you have some sort of uh, credit as well uh, you know if you, if you don't have the history it's very hard for a bank uh, uh, to reflect and and tr uh, try and predict how you would behave in the future. Okay, so is this from a personal perspective or a business perspective? Uh, so, so I think uh, very much both. Uh, we'll look uh, definitely at your, your personal uh, accounts uh, and how you've uh, conducted your credit agreements and, at a personal level. Uh, and then we'll also delve into the, into the business side and ensure that uh, uh, those have been managed favorably as well. Okay, so, so just explain the process of uh, surety from, from, from your business. You mentioned it as you, you gave your answer. So it was one of the points that you highlighted. What mm. is that and what is the process of that? And, and are there any benefits associated to that? And what's the solve for it? Um, yeah, so the benefit uh, for that is, you know, if the individual is perhaps, uh, uh, you know, can't afford the, the loan, just from the salary or drawings that they take from the business, 
uh, we could uh, you know utilize some of the cash flow that uh, that's within the business and leverage that uh, as part of the affordability assessment um, and, uh, but in doing that we do then require the the business to sign surety on behalf of the deal so as you know that currently the the trend is that uh, salaried people are um, starting their own businesses as a form of getting additional funds, right? So what is the difference uh, between the payment structure for somebody who's acquiring a home loan as a self-employed individual, as well as if somebody is acquiring a home loan as a salaried individual? Um, so in Tabi, there's actually uh, not no difference between a the repayment structure for a salaried or a self-employed individual. Um, it, it, it's very much the same, uh, but we do offer uh, you know different repayment uh, types uh, for these uh, 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 for both clients. Um, so we offer the normal amortizing repayment type, uh, which is your normal capital plus interest. Um, then we also offer the interest only, which is where you pay interest only for a certain period. Um, and then there's an, also an interest roll-up option, which is where uh, interest capitalizes monthly to create uh, some additional cash flow. Okay. Uh, so and then sometimes okay. we can also have a blend of these options, depending on what the client needs are. Okay. So um, you've mentioned quite a number of uh, um, things here, and you've utilized the bank's jargon. So what is an amortizing loan? What's a non-amortizing loan? Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So, so yeah, that's a good question. So, an amortizing loan is uh, more of your traditional loan, where um, through fixed payments, uh, the principal balance or limit reduces at the end of the term. So, if you uh, if you entirely stuck to your payments uh, throughout, um, generally at the end of the term, you would have paid off the loan completely. Um, a non-amortizing loan may or may not require a, a fixed payment, uh, but these payments, and this is where the difference comes in, do not reduce the limit. Um, so this means you have access to the full facility amount or limit at any time during the long term. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, who qualifies for these? Um, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of uh, qualification, it's obviously uh, subject to credit approval. Uh, but anyone, uh, you know, that banks in the in the private banking space is welcome to apply. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, we're aware that um, FNB has rolled out a young professionals offering. Um, what what is that offering? Can you just take us through? what that offering is, who qualifies for it, what are the benefits, and how can people actually start taking the solution up? Um, yeah, so, so, so we definitely recognize that uh, young professionals have a high earning potential uh, in the long term, and they might want to leverage that future earning capacity earlier on in their career. Um, so what we offer is a 105% bond, where we finance 100% of the purchase price, um, with an additional 5% that can be utilized to fund perhaps some of the transfer of bond costs associated with buying that specific property. Um, we also offer a repayment option, uh, which allows to pay interest only for the first uh, three years, which helps YPs to manage their, uh, you know, young professionals to manage their, their cash flow. Um, and then, you know, if, if, if anyone is uh, interested in taking up this uh, young professional offering, they can, they're more than welcome to get in contact with their banker, um, who will then assist them through the process uh, of, of getting into the solution. Would you then be able to guide us as to who these people are and how, how the bank defines young professionals? Yeah, sure. So, so, so we consider a young professional as any professional that's... Uh, under the age of uh, 35, earning less than one and a half million, um, and, and who's qualified in one of the following uh, professions. So an actuary, um, an architect, an attorney, a chartered accountant, an engineer, or a uh, medical doctor. What about individuals that um, don't fall within that space, but earn as much as that and have other qualifications? Will the bank turn them away? If they want to apply for a home loan, will they not be granted um, the value proposition that falls under young professionals? 
Um, so we obviously have different uh, options available for different clients. Um, this, this specific option is tailored uh, specifically at young professionals, but anyone is, is, is welcome to apply at any time. And, uh, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, we understand that everyone's needs are unique uh, and we try and solve appropriately for them. So just on that, on the acquisition of, of home, of a home. I know that uh, you guys are not only looking at first time home, home buyers, but you're also looking at people that want to purchase um, the second, third or fourth property. Would you mm -hmm. then be able to guide us as to how one can actually start portfolio? Yeah, sure. So I think obviously um, the, the, the first place is um, to do a lot of planning and to get as much information as possible. Um, we have uh, uh, some services and products that are specifically tailored towards, uh, uh, you know, building up a property portfolio. Uh, so I think uh, most importantly, we have a team of very knowledgeable bankers and, and lending specialists uh, that can help you, help guide you on this uh, wealth creation journey. Um, and then on top of that, we do have products that are very much tailored towards uh, having a property portfolio, uh, just to name a few, for example, the single facility and the structured loan. You've mentioned a single facility as well as a structured loan. Uh, what, what are those solutions and how do they work and, and how can they benefit me if I then want to start a property portfolio? Uh, sure. So a, a key benefit, uh, I think, that would help uh, that exists in these products is that you're able to uh, borrow against uh, mixed collateral. Um, so what that means is you could borrow against uh, property, cash, uh, or even a share or investment portfolio. Um, and then as we discussed um, above, these products also allow you to structure different repayment options, um, which will help you optimize your cash flow. Uh, which is much needed when you're building up a property portfolio. Okay. There's that uh, bank jargon again. What does uh, optimize your, your portfolio mean? Um, so, so, so when I mentioned optimize your, your cash flow, um, obviously yeah, having, uh, uh, you know, cash on hand um, um, makes it easier for you to acquire further properties or further investments. Um, so utilizing those different repayment options, uh, you know, you can almost structure uh, your loan uh, so that it works in your favor when it comes to, to managing your cash flow effectively. As a, uh, an expert in the um, home ownership space, um, you would know that there are a lot of uh, myths around the acquisition of a home or retention of a home. What is that one myth that you would like to bust as an ex expert within this field? Uh, young Toby, I think uh, given that we're talking about uh, young professionals, uh, self-employed and individuals and retirees, perhaps the myth um, that we hear quite often is that I'm too young or too old to uh, buy a property. Um, so, so, so maybe you just finished university and you, you started your first job and um, you know, you're thinking about entering into the property market. Uh, I think, uh, to be honest, if you think you financial, you have the financial ability uh, to purchase a property, uh, it's definitely something you should consider as a as an individual, um, because I mean, a lot of people have created a lot of wealth um, through owning and purchasing property. Um, then, on the flip side, uh, perhaps you're about to retire, or you want to uh, downsize, or purchase an investment property. Um, to supplement your income while you're retired. Um, so I think purchasing a property uh, is not really very age dependent, but uh, should lar largely be driven um, through an individual's needs. Okay, thank you. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. You are never too young or too old to own a property or start your investment portfolio. So with that said, we are signing out. Thank you so much for joining us on our couch, Colin. Uh, we appreciate the time and effort that you've given us. We hope to have further discussions around uh, the acquisition of a home and um, any other knowledge sharing session. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ntabi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the couch. We have an esteemed expert who will be talking housing schemes. Welcome, Paul. Hi, Ntabi. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. 
Thank you for joining us, Paul. So uh, please just take the opportunity to tell us who you are and what you do at FNB. Hi, everyone. My name is Paul Ramadong. I am representing FNB. I look after a portfolio called Housing Schemes under the Home, home Loans Division of FNB. Great. So, Mpo, uh, you look after housing schemes. What is that? So, housing schemes is a function of FNB partnering with employers where we would custom make a solution to the employees of a company uh, in terms of offering a housing solution. So housing solution in a form of a home loan, or rather maybe making a home ownership a possibility within a paradigm of a company. Oh, that's fantastic. So are you then saying that what you guys have created is very different from uh, the generic offering that FNB has when it talks home loans? Not necessarily, but it's just that the approach is rather different because we were actually trying to solve for challenges that most of our corporate clients were challenged with when it comes to employee retention, or what value adds under the rewards and benefits what they offer to their employees. Okay. So this is how the solutioning came about to say, hey, Mr. Employer, as FMB, this is a value proposition or value add that we are willing to contribute towards making the livelihoods of your employees better. Oh, that's fantastic. I think that that's such a great way of getting people to be homeowners. Um, so with that, how, how does it really work? So I understand that um, this is a value proposition that has been created for organizations to benefit their employees, but how does it really work between FNB and the partnerships that um, they've formed, which positively affect the person that is trying to acquire a home? Sure. So our operating model seeks to leverage best-in-class configurations of housing schemes based on our experience as FNB. Uh, we also focus on ensuring that we educate the first homeowners because, you know, like, uh, owning a home, it's almost like your lifetime commitment or wealth building um, sort of a commitment that you would do as a consumer. So under this portfolio, what we try to do is to hold your hand, try to guide you and um, inform you in terms of what to expect at each and every single milestone. Uh, the other nice benefit that comes with this is that in terms of the jargon, because you know that a lot of times banks you tend to use a jargon that is not so consumer friendly. Um, my team will be able to step in and try to assist you and unpack whatever issues or challenges that you might come up with. That's great. So it, it's, it really demonstrates help that, that F&B is always punting out there. So mm -hmm. you mentioned first class configurations. What would those be? So, you know, for each and every single organization, they would have uh, different objectives, they will have different goals that they will be working towards. So what we try to do is to listen first to the needs of our customers, what is it that they're trying to achieve, what the pain points are that they're currently experiencing, based on the information that they would give us, then we'll go back and come up with a solution that is bespoke and customized specifically for, for the company or the corporate. That's fantastic. Thing. Paul, how does, how does one um, form part of, of the scheme? So like I said, we would need to enter into some sort of an agreement with a company. Uh, we'd need to outline whatever the needs that they would try to have FMB to solve for. Once all the formalities have been put aside, uh, then that's only when we would launch and try to unpack and explain the benefits to, to the employees. So in terms of who qualifies for, for the solution, when you look into a company, uh, everyone that works for that company, from a security guard up to the CEO. Do you guys target organizations or can organizations come to you to say we want to be part of this? So it's both. There is organizations that we are very intentional when we go out in the market and we position ourselves as such. 
And we also open to those organizations that might have heard of our offering and they would like for us to extend it to them. Which organizations have you guys partnered with? So there's quite a, a few companies. Well, it's quite a lot of companies that we have under the portfolio. But when we would categorize it under the industry, we have your automobiles, you have your tourism and hospitality, we have your financial sector and health sector. So in terms of groupings, those are the industries where we are predominant in. To date, how many people have you guys helped? within the scheme? So there's quite a handsome number of people that we have helped under the scheme. And what I really like about um, the scheme, the benefit is that through the partnership with the employer, you might find that other employers are willing to put something on the table to make it a reality or some sort of an enablement for the employees to qualify. So what we'll do is when we reconfigure the solutioning for that company, we will include that uh, financial assistance that the employer will be giving. So in terms of the numbers, when you look at how the scheme operates, the success rate uh, under the scheme versus a normal deal that is not backed by the employer, we're looking at about 80% because of the parameters that we put in place to ensure that we really do um, get as many people as possible into the houses. So when you say 80%, is this 80% as an overall target um, or is it 80% per um, organization that you guys have worked with? So it's 80% overall. How do these people that fall under, under the scheme apply for a home loan? Is it in the traditional way or is there a specifically crafted route for them to take? So first price would encourage the employees to come directly to us because first of all, would know how to deal with the application forms. But there is other channels uh, outside of the employees coming directly to FMB that they can use. But I think the way that we assist to try and ensure that uh, we are the first point of call when it comes to the employees that we do uh, what we call site visits to the places of employment whereby we will set up um, appointments or meetings with the employees where we can take them through the journey of applying for, for a home loan. When was this uh, solution created and why was it created? So in April 2006, the conversation started within FMB and a question that was asked was, what if by enriching our people financially, we could be enriching the nation? So at that time, FMB focused on the good that was happening in the market. And when we talked about building a nation, we thought owning a home was a hot topic, of which it still is today. And hence the reason why we had come up with such a portfolio. For those that are interested in this offering, where can they get the information? Yes, sure. So they can just email us because, like I said, that each and every single uh, value proposition that we present to corporates is, is bespoke to the uh, problem or pain points that the company might be wanting to solve for. So they can send an email on the following email address at HF dot housing schemes one word at fmv.co.za thank you for for sharing this information and for uh, you guys are definitely sticking to the notion of how can we help you and you are sticking to being an innovative bank which then helps all south africans become homeowners we really appreciate that just before i let you go as with everyone um there's always a a myth that is created around the acquisition of a home. Um, from your stance, what would be the myth that you want to dispel? Yes, Ntabi. So a lot of times consumers like to disqualify themselves for, for, for a home loan or owning the home, whereby you'd find that they would opt for renting instead of buying a home. So the myth is that I would like to bust is that um, renting is not a cheaper option. Owning a home, it's better because 
uh, what you are doing in the long term is that you are actually helping someone pay off their bond. So why not rather use that money towards paying off your own home loan? Fantastic. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Mpo. Thank you for sitting with us and having coffee and sharing your knowledge with us. We really do appreciate you. And we hope to have further discussions around um, your portfolio and how it can uh, help further people within, uh, within the country when it comes to home ownership. No, certainly. Thank you so much, Interview, for having me. This was great. I look forward to the future engagements. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Paul.